Good morning. This is Brian Wallace, Director of Marketing at Tia for Consulting, and welcome to our October webinar. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time out to be here today. We got about 45 minutes uh, scheduled today to cover this content. Tonight, today's topic is let's talk about transformation. It's a peek inside of Andy Coyle's notebook. He's a consultant here at Kiefer Consulting. Uh, just a couple quick housekeeping things. Uh, if you have a question during the session, the GoToWebinar panel over to the side has a little tab that says questions. You can go ahead and enter them there. And I'll be watching this uh, throughout the presentation. And if we do get time, we'll try to answer them as we go through the presentation. If not, we'll wait till the end. Um, and if we run out of time, right up against the 1045 stop time, uh, we'll reach out to you and we'll connect with you on some of these questions that you might have. There is one handout and it's also available in the side tab. It is a uh, infographic that kind of captures some of the, uh, the, some of the topic today that we're talking about. Uh, talking about business transformation. And at the end of this presentation, there will be a quick survey that will pop up on your screen. Please look for it. It's only got five questions. It's multiple choice. We really do appreciate your feedback because uh, it does help us uh, as we start to plan these from month to month. So I'd like to introduce Andy Coyle. Andy. Yay, Andy Coyle here. <laughs> and the, how's it going? The name of this presentation is Let's Talk About Transfer, Transformation, a peek inside my notebook as Brian just mentioned, how come my page isn't going to the next page? I was just doing this, there we go. About me, I've been at Keeper Consulting for 10 years and I'm focused on SharePoint. So this presentation is SharePoint based. Uh, a lot of SharePoint uh, experience here that's gonna bleed into this presentation, but the concepts are true for any sort of uh, tra business transformation that you wanna do. We've worked at radio stations, state government, local government, private companies. I've been at this uh, for 10 years. Before that, I had my own consulting company for 10 years at, uh, that we focused on health services. And before that, I was a systems engineer at uh, electronic data systems for 14 years. And um, large systems like General Motors, uh, product development also, which was multiple systems that we developed. and medi which is a huge system that we worked on. Uh, so before I go to the introduction page, oh, it's not going backwards, I gotta give you my icebreaker spiel. There's an old, um, there's an old uh, saw out there that uh, Henry Ford was having a problem with his uh, assembly line. And he called up Tesla, hey Tesla, I'm having some problems with my assembly line, could you come out and look at it? Tesla goes out, looks it over, takes a piece of chalk, marks the machine with a piece of chalk and said, here's your problem right here. Ford fixed it and he says, oh, that's great. Just send me the invoice. And so Tesla sent him an invoice for $50,000 and Ford's like, $50,000, are you crazy? Could you, could you uh, give me a detailed invoice? Sure. So the detailed invoice comes up and it says, one piece of chalk, $1. Knowing where to put it, $49,999. So that's kind of the old thing of a consultant, uh, knowing where to put the piece of chalk. But really what, it's, what it really comes down to, that's kind of a, the industry standard, but I really call it, um, there's three consultants in a room, or sorry, there's a high price consultant, a low price consultant, and Santa Claus are in a room. In the center of the table, there's $50,000. The light goes out, light comes back on, the $50,000 is gone. What happened? Who took the money? And the answer is, it's the high price consultant because the low price consultant and Santa Claus are figments of your imagination. So, <laughs> just, just kind of to break the ice uh, about what I do consulting on a daily basis. But what we're here to talk about is getting things done how do we get things done? How do we get people involved? As consultants, we come in and we are focused, hyper-focused on getting our piece of the project done. But that requires us um, getting along with and connecting with and stealing time from the people that have to, um, have to actually collaborate up with us to get their work. And they have other work to, work to do. The common pitfalls in getting things done are organizational resistance, lack of project sponsorship, 
poor change management, uh, missing goals, unrealistic expectations. And we'll be talking about all these, um, all these things. As I said, as a consultant, we're coming in. If we're helping on a project, I'll tell you what I see from the outside. Sometimes we can't see how our own uh, organization is working without some eyes from the outside. And this is what I see when I come in and try to get a project done at a customer. First thing we encounter is usually organizational resistance. You know, departments, they, they don't, um, they don't want to make changes. Everyone says change is good and we want to change and we want to make it better. But people always say to me, I want to change, Dandy. I want to make it better, but I don't want to change anything. I want to change, but I don't want to change anything. It's, that is a huge dichotomy that you cannot resolve. We either have to change it and you're going to have to learn something new to get the benefit of doing it better, faster, with more uh, metrics. Or we don't change it and you just leave it the way it is. Sometimes I do go in and advise people, well, this is working for you now. It's such a low volume of work. You would pay a lot of money to get it to be automated, but it's, it's a small volume of work. It's not going to pay off. There's no long-term um, there's no long-term benefit. So the willingness of an organization to change is a big, a big deal. And we see indicators. When, when I go into a, a new shop or a new project, I'm looking for indicators of why, of, of organiz, organizational resistance. So we'll look at some indicators and how to get around or try to resolve those uh, organizational resistance points. A lot of times I'll go in and, and they say, we've tried that before. So we've, we've tried that before. And how do we get it? You see this all the time. IT made a, uh, IT tried it. Uh, it. It was a point solution. It had dubious success. The training wasn't good. The rollout wasn't there. The uh, um, ongoing training, new employees didn't know the process. So that effort might have failed. And our experienced partners, when we get into a new engagement, will say, hey, we've tried that before. I don't think it's going to work again. The next thing we see a lot of is there's nothing wrong with our process. There's nothing wrong with our process. I went into. Um, one customer who's going to remain nameless. But I go into the customer and it happens more frequently than you would think. There's an HR department, an IT department, and an accounting department. And I interview the HR department. I say, here's the process. What's the process? Well, we're, we're onboarding new staff and it goes from HR. We enter our information. Then IT has to set them up with uh, you know, a phone and a desktop and an account. And then uh, accounting needs to register them in the uh, accounting software package and get them, train them on the, the uh, time accounting system, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what's, what's going wrong with that process now? Oh, HR will tell me there's nothing wrong with our process, but IT doesn't get the password to the user. They send the email to the user, but the user doesn't have an email account, so they can't get the password. And IT doesn't do this, and IT doesn't do that, and accounting doesn't train them on how to use the timekeeping system and the right way to code their entry. Okay, great. So I make those notes. The next, um, I go to IT, and they say, I say, what's wrong with this process? And they say, nothing's wrong with the process. Nothing's wrong with the process. No. But HR doesn't do this, and HR doesn't uh, notify us in time, and HR doesn't give us the person's full name, and accounting doesn't train on uh, the time code billing system, so all our metrics are wrong. Okay, great. And I go to accounting, and accounting, hey, accounting, what's wrong with the process? There's nothing wrong with our process in accounting, but IT doesn't have the right metrics listed, and HR doesn't get the person's the information to IT to set it up, and HR, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of, what you see is a lot of, hey, we've honed our process. In these individual groups, you see people have honed their process, and they like their process, but they certainly can see what's wrong with um, the other groups. And as an outside consultant, we see this 
what's wrong holistically across an entire process. We don't have the time to contribute. So, uh, you know, process reengineering is not what the stakeholder is eventually me measured on. You know, that's not their primary business. It is a future gain that they're going to get if they contribute now, but they don't have time to contribute now because they get measured on what they're doing in their primary job and not this redevelopment effort. A lot of times we see that there are more approvers than contributors. So people want to approve a process, then contribute to it. And they'll want to see the entire process and say yes or no on the process, but they don't want to, they don't want to contribute to the process. Uh, and it's difficult to get a process that works for everybody if everybody's not contributing to it. A lot of staff won't acknowledge that they're the subject matter experts, so they'll come in and uh, obviously staff is the key to improving their process. They know the business. I'm coming in as a outside entity. How can I improve your, improve your process? Well, first of all, I don't know what it is, so I ask who the subject matter experts are that I can talk to. And uh, people will do a lot of finger pointing in this area as well. So they'll say, George knows about that. And George, well, I'm not really the expert in it. And Mary is the expert. Okay, Mary. And Mary's dubious about her knowledge. They, nobody wants to look or take responsibility on it. And same by the same portion, staff don't acknowledge their responsibilities for the areas of the process that belong to them. The entire process may not belong to them, but there's certainly a portion of the process that belongs to them and they need to be responsible for it. We've seen where the subject matter experts don't uh, attend design meetings. If you see that, you have organizational resistance and you're going to have to address that. Uh, and design sessions are poorly attended in general. That always, that has a couple of implications, which is people don't think it's that important if you don't get people to attend and you're going to have problems being successful when people don't think it's important or can spend the time and effort on it. We were in that one customer and uh, we're doing a design session. And in the design session, it became very clear that nobody knew what the process was. So the, the existing process is not well understood. The existing outcomes that they're looking for are not well understood. The existing uh, measurements of success are not well understood. And if you see uh, design sessions are, are revealing that the process is not well understood by the people in that meeting, either uh, you've got organizational resistance because either the people don't know what the process is or the proper people aren't in the room. And the final one is people don't like to be measured. Uh, we were at one customer and the customer was, uh, the overall customer, the head, the director, basically said, I want a system. We've got a problem with our graphic design request. So I want you to create a system that queues up the graphic design request and moves them through the graphic design process and um, comes out on the other end so that our graphic design um, projects move quickly through the system. Great. We talk to the graphic design people and we say, um, what we're going to do is we're going to, we talk to them about what they, how they do their work. And we say, we're going to create a, uh, a system to track the pipeline, track what's due, track what's overdue, and everyone put them on dashboards and promote that information so that everybody can see where you guys are at with their, with your customer's project, design project. And the graphic design, the head of the graphic design department said, this is all well and good. I don't want to use it because I don't want to, I, I don't want people to know. I don't want to be measured. I don't want people to know what's in the queue, how busy or not busy we are. I, you know, I can't overcome that uh, attitude of I don't want to be measured. People don't want to be measured. But there are people that do want to be measured. And I take a second to think. Who do you think wants to be measured? It's always the highest performing people or the people that want to improve 
are the people that want to be measured. They want to know what the goal is. You look at you look at a track star. They want to know what their 100 meter dash is. You look at a football player. They want to know what their 40 yard dash, their 40 yard sprint time is. You look at uh, a marathon runner. They track their uh, time. So they want to be measured so that they can tell whether or not they're doing better or worse. If uh, a lot of times in organizations, we see that people don't want to be measured, and there, this is a complex area. People don't want to be measured because they're not sure the measurements are going to be correct. They're not sure it's going to properly reflect all the work they're doing. Um, there's a number of reasons why people don't want to be measured. So that's organizational resistance. We see it a lot when we go into a project, so we have to have tools in our tool bag that say, uh, how do we overcome that? So leveraging against organizational resistance. Keep it simple and plan for iterations. So what does that mean? Keep it simple and plan for iterations. It means in software development and in process redesign and organizational reconfiguration, it's an ongoing process. So a lot of people have this waterfall mentality where they call up the consultant or they call up or they're getting a software package or they're local IT shop is going has a project to do. They build the project and they think they drop it in once and we're done and that's it. But that software or process isn't gonna live if it doesn't constantly change. So you can't think of all the what ifs at the beginning. You can only think of the major what ifs. So you need to keep it simple at the beginning. If you wanted to go to the grocery store, the dream is driving a nice car to the grocery store. So you can see that, you know, if I just have a wheel, uh, that's not really going to do anything. If I got a wheel uh, and a frame of the car, that's not going to do some much. If I just had the body, it's not going to do much. I need the whole thing. So for some projects, yeah, you got to have the whole thing to get somewhere. But really, on a lot of, a lot of projects, you could start out small and either trash the whole thing, which is this is showing. Start out with a skateboard, is skateboard going to do it? No, I don't want to learn to ride a skateboard. Is a scooter going to do it? Yeah, okay, I can get to the store, but I can't bring my groceries back. Is a bicycle going to do it? Yeah, I can get along with a bicycle for a while until um, the store, I move out to the country, at which point the store is too far, so maybe I can get a motorcycle. That's the minimum amount I can get away with, and the motorcycle is fine for the summer, but when it starts to rain, you're going to eventually need the car, and in this case, it's a convertible. Uh, so the rent, you're going to have to put the top up, I guess. <laughs> so you got to start out with the minimum, the minimum you need and then continually improve it. So you have to be able to under, also understand, um, you have to be able to understand the consumption versus production pattern. And what do I mean by consum consumption versus production? If I were building a website for you, I would have, if I were building Amazon.com, for instance, I would know that the bulk of my users are going to be consumers of the information. So I have to make it extremely easy for them to consume the information. I have to make it extremely easy for them to buy um, a widget, whatever that widget is. So in that case, the consumption is very high. And what's the production? Well, I have to put the items in to the system. I have to have a workflow for those items so that I know it, when it's getting sent and I can track the package and when it was delivered and how to handle returns. So producing the information that's in the system is much more expensive than the consumption of that information, but it's difficult to, um, you always have to know what that consumption versus production pattern is so that you can properly balance um, your your um, system. Plan for flexibility. So you always want to plan to be flexible. We had, I've had a customer, we're building a workflow for a customer and the customer uh, says it goes, it always goes, this, this folder approval process always goes from person A to person B to person C. Okay, great. So here's your workflow of person A, B, C. Do you ever have um, the workflow going from person A to person C. You know, you're skipping person B or you just have to skip steps because it's a hot topic. 
Yeah, we 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 do that all the time. We do that. Yes, we do. Oh, do you want me to bake that in? No. So they roll out the system. I baked it in anyway, and they say, well, there's no way for us to do these special cases where we're jumping from the front of the workflow to the end of the workflow because we have to rush this approval through. So you have to have that plan in there for flexibility. The simpler it is, the more flexible you're going to be able to plan or you're going to be able to implement more flexibility when the system is simple. If it's very complicated and there's lots of complicated business logic in there, you're, the system is not going to be as flexible. You got to play with people who want to play. So uh, if people do not want to participate, you are going to have problems no matter what. So we always start out with the people that are very excited, and usually those are the people that are going to be the big, biggest beneficiaries of the system. I like to design with the Amazon.com rule, which is keep it extremely simple for the person to consume it. So I need I nobody goes and gets training at Amazon.com. Nobody says. I couldn't buy a uh, I couldn't buy a new stereo on Amazon because they didn't train me how to use the site. No, everybody knows how to use uh, the site. There's no training involved when you're a consumer. You can it, a properly designed system will allow you to understand how to navigate through the system without any um, without any training. That's different on the production side. Production side, of course, you need training. I need to tell you how to enter in a item. I need to tell you how to track a, uh, a user's failed shipment. But on the consumption side, we want to keep it as simple as possible and as um, training free to consume it. New technology or maturity in a simple technology, like if you've been using SharePoint, I'm going to use SharePoint out there. If you've been using SharePoint for six years, the last time we tried this, we had been using SharePoint for two months, but now we're very familiar with SharePoint. So technology maturity may overcome the we've tried that before um, uh, problem. I always try to have my design sessions with agendas and minutes. Agendas and minutes are very important for everybody. I know it's work to create them, but everybody in the meeting knows what you're going to talk about. You talk about those points and you get out of the meeting. Just because you have a meeting for an hour shouldn't mean you're in the meeting for an hour. If you make the process easier than the existing process, you are going to overcome resistance. That's all there is to it. If it's easier to click this button than for me to take this folder and walk over to your desk and you're not there, now what do I do? I'm going to click the button. Andy, yeah. I got a quick question for you. Yep. As it relates to organizational resistance, there was a question that came in from Krista, and I think you mentioned that people don't like to be measured. One of the one of she, one of the questions, her question was, is it possible that there's just really no agreement on the measurement criteria? Yes. Okay. There is possible that there's no agreement on the measurement criteria. It is a constantly. Uh, it's an area of constant change when I'm measuring because as soon as you put one measurement in, let's put a single measurement in, it's changing the flow of that river. So you're putting a rock in the middle of that river and the water is going to go around it in two different ways. You're going to have to put another rock in and another rock in and another rock in to finally get the river going in the direction you want it to go. So it's a constantly, um, as soon as I measure you, you're going to change your behavior. And I don't know, I, it's very difficult to predict what that behavior is going to be of my user once I put a, that measurement in and they're getting measured on this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it is a, it's more art than science, but it is certainly a place where you drop a stake in and you continue down the measurement road towards your goal. And we'll talk some more about goals later because measurements really come along with, with goals. Okay, cool. Make the biggest process easier, but you can outlaw existing process, the existing process. So people, if you're trying to get on SharePoint, one of the things you can do is say, hey, you can no longer store this type of document on the G drive. It has to be stored in SharePoint. And you use technology to block addition to the G drive. That's just kind of a generic example, but example nonetheless. Uh, the other thing, a, a measurement, nobody likes to be measured, but the way you get around instituting measurements is you say, look, 
we're I'm going to put these measurements in, but I am not going to I am not going to blame you for this measurement because it's brand new. You had no idea that you were supposed to conform to this measurement. Now I'm going to put the measurement in. Now in six months or a year, I need you to conform to the measurement. What this does is twofold. It gives you it gives you kind of immunity while the system's getting up and running, and at the end of a year, if you're meeting that measurement, you can you can point back. The user can point back and say, "Look, we were at you know one percent a year ago, and now we're at ninety seven percent or whatever the metric is." So you also by instituting measurement grace periods, you're also putting sowing the seeds for success for a success story to say, hey, we had success here. The next thing is no executive sponsorship. If you don't have an executive, if you have the IT, finance, and HR problems, you know, you're trying to get these individual groups to work together, you're gonna need somebody above that to sponsor. And uh, somebody who has their control over those group, groups and has their hand on their throats to be able to say, you're going to do it. And I have this vision as an executive sponsor that this is the way we're going to go. So what are uh, indicators that executive sponsorship is missing? Stakeholders believe the current way is the easiest. So why should we change it? Usually it is the easiest for them. Stakeholders don't see what's in it for them. They often feel that the beneficiary is someone else. In fact, you see this with IT groups all the time. People ask IT to do all this extra work, and they're not going to get any benefit out of it. We'll talk more about that later, but you know, they're not going to get any benefit out of the work that they put in. Design sessions are poorly attended, and stakeholders are apathetic. That goes the same to the same um, notes that we talked about before. You get lopsided design. So if I have a uh, system that's supposed to span IT, HR, and accounting. The design is well attended by IT. <laughs> Guess what? You're going to get an IT system. They're going to corrupt the, the design because participation isn't being held in uh, the, the other groups aren't being participating well in it. The number one probably is the project vision or goals are not clear or not communicated down to the uh, stakeholders. So the executive, the reason the executive is there is to say, hey, we're going to make this better for all of you, IT, HR, and accounting, and this is how we're going to make it. And there's going to be some sweat that we're going to have to do, but the vision is that at the end, it is going to make our process better. And you, if you don't have that, you're gonna you got a problem with executive sponsorship. Stakeholder project responsibilities and commitments uh, to the project are unclear. So you, I have people working in the individual HR, IT, or accounting group, and they don't know why they're there. They don't know how much time they're supposed to dedicate to the project. They don't know uh, what their role in the project is. Um, so it, that makes it difficult to go forward. They don't. Similarly speaking, what is the priority of this project? Now, an executive is going to say, hey, uh, the, if you have strong executive sponsorship, they'll say, hey, the priority is number one. This is the number one thing we're doing here besides keeping the lights on. Or they might say this is the number 40 thing. But if they don't tell you or tell their stakeholders what the priority of the project is, you're going to get um, hard time to make traction on a project. We always see this, this is similar to what we said before. Stakeholders want to approve the process, but they don't want to forge it. When you have an outside consultant coming in and you want me to make your business process, you've got some problems because I can assist you, I can understand it, but I don't, I don't, I have a day or two to understand your process. You've been working your process for a long time. So you really need a stakeholder in that process. You really need to forge it. Uh, a lot of times, like I said, it's a waterfall deployment and we dropped this in and there was no thought about the ongoing support costs for the system. We always try to tell you what the ongoing support cost is. So how do we leverage against weak executive sponsorship? 
the first thing we'll try to do is play again, play with the people who want to play. So those are the people that see the benefit. People that don't want to play don't see the benefit. And there's a lot of talking you can do, but they're never going to see the benefit until they, they're doubting Thomas's. They'll never see the benefit until it's right in front of their face. So you really have to play with those who want to play. And unfortunately, a lot of times it does lopside the system to those people who want to play. But if you keep it simple and you make sure it's an iterative process, as new people come on and come on board, new functions and features can be added. Without a single executive sponsor, you can always get uh, the IT department, the HR department, and accounting department heads together. If those three people are all on the same page and want it to happen, you can get around weak executive sponsorship by having co-sponsors. You always have to, at the 10,000 foot level, say, hey, what are the net benefits? What's the driving reasons that we're going to do these to get stakeholder buy-in? And the best way to get a system or process improvement is that the bulk of the burden, so the bulk of the burden is before is borne by the people that are going to benefit the most. A lot of times that's not the case, but in the most successful systems, you always see that. They see how um, it's going to benefit them, make their job easier so that they can not focus on the monotonous chores and focus on the stuff, the brain power stuff. Um, and they have to forge the system like that. IT, one of the things you have to have in your IT group is the IT has to accept the fact that they need to participate in all these uh, projects and they're never going to get any benefit out of it. <laughs> so there's never, there's never an IT benefit for improving HR. It's an overall benefit to the company. So IT has to accept their role that they're a key stakeholder in all these things. They have to, of course, provide security, guidance, and construction of IT projects, but they're not going to get much more benefit out of it. We, to get over weak executive sponsorship, you should also get to the stakeholders and tell them, you know, we expect you to be in these design sessions an hour a week. We expect you to review these documents. That's going to be three hours here. We expect you to work on user acceptance testing, blah, 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 blah. So define those hours and expectations up front. It has a lot to do with uh, overcoming weak executive sponsorship. And we always try to define the level of ongoing support to the system. Like I said, if you just dump the system off and leave, that system will die without the proper care and feeding and improvement as time goes on. And if you, you need to be honest and realistic to say, is this system going, the cost of the system going to be worth it? So you have to look at that and say, just because we have the money to spend or there's, seems like there's a problem here, is some sort of computerized system that's really overkill gonna gonna solve the problem so you gotta that's an honesty checkpoint next thing is change management plan so uh, change management plan you got to be able to change your your um, you have to be able to control the way changes go into the system so we see uh, Weak, in the weak change management plan when there's no deployment procedures. I don't know how to get something to dev into production, or we don't even have a development or a testing site. What are we doing then? So there's no deployment. There's no permanent deployment responsibilities for the project I'm working on. So who's going to deploy this on an ongoing basis? Oh, we'll figure that out later. That's not good. Uh, there's no ongoing schedule. You, every project we put in, we plan for, uh, you should be implementing new changes or updates or bug fixes at the very least once a month, once every two months, once every week. I don't know what it is, but if you don't have a schedule, then you don't really have a change management plan. If there's no existing downtime uh, window or uh, agreed upon um, fix window, you don't have a change management plan. If you don't have a uh, a list of features or capabilities that are going in and communicating those to people, you've got a weak change management plan. 
if you don't have any training guides or videos or uh, sessions, training sessions, and no ability to put in an ongoing training or an as-needed training for new employees or transferring staff, then you don't have a change management plan. If you, I'm starting to sound like Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> if you, what is that? You might be a redneck, okay? <laughs> a recurring bug, uh, bug waves or feature misses. So if you have a bug that's coming up every month and it's, we got the same bug this month as we had last month and we thought we fixed it, or as soon as you do a deployment, you get a wave of bugs, or you're getting, you're deploying a feature and the feature doesn't do what the customer wanted the feature to do, you're having feature misses, you've got a change yeah, management plan. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we can. If you have recurring user questions and question waves, waves of questions after release, release what do you have, Brian? A uh, weak change management plan. Good. I'm learning. If you have no, if you're missing a feedback loop from your customers or you're not doing user acceptance, acceptance testing or validation, you've got a weak change management plan. And you need, uh, if you don't have all your stakeholders contact information ready and available that are going to be working on the system, you've got a weak change management plan. And if you don't have regular communication with stakeholders, you've got a weak change management plan. So how do we address those? Oftentimes we'll ex reference an existence governance or policy and start building off existing governments for change management. Oh, the month, the nightly cycle is on Friday nights. Okay, we're gonna have our nightly cycle on Friday nights as well. Uh, you, need, you need to develop production and promotion, uh, deployment and promotion procedures. The ultimate goal is a one button deployment and one button retraction so that I can compile build everything and press one button to have it deployed. And if there's some problem, I can press one button and have it retract. That's the goal. It's very difficult to do it at the beginning, but it's a ongoing process that should be honed. You should have weekly, monthly, or whatever it is, predictable, predictable deployments with a, in an agreed upon maintenance window. So the predictability is good there so that people can get into the cadence of, oh, I have a bug, I put a, enter the bug in, they fixed my bug in one in one cycle. Oh, it's not such a big bug. They fixed it in five cycles. Okay, great. Complete stakeholder list with regular communication. Uh, you definitely need those. Publish upcoming deployments and features of the stakeholder list. So when we make the changes or somebody reports a bug, we tell them that we fixed their bug or we added their feature. And this is a tough one, but we should be doing it. Revisit all training documentation, each deployment, and documentation should, if it's to exist at all, it should be current. We should never have document on a shelf that's not current. So your documentation uh, should, ma should make assumptions about the audience, so your documentation should be you know, uh, specific to a, a role, and your documentation be, should be updated. You should have regression tests. So every new bug has a test created, and we run those tests all the time, and the test set just gets bigger and bigger. We should perform user acceptance testing. So users should determine if the changes are fit for production. I tell you, you got the biggest problem if you're depending on the developer to tell you that it's fit for production, because the developer uh, doesn't see the bugs. They don't see their baby's teeth. They're not straight. <laughs> Next thing, failure to establish goals is a big uh, problem. The key indicators is team doesn't know what the current process is. They don't know what the, the to be process is. They constantly debate, debate whether or not we should do it with this technology or that technology or what the practice should be. The schedules grow and the task lists grow. The list of features grows. Features can't be prior to prioritized. I had one customer that I said, we need all these features prioritized. They went off, they prioritized the features. They're all priority one. That is not a prioritization. New team members uh, are always added to the process project. That is a key indicator that nobody knows what the goals are. We're not meeting milestones or metrics. The same risk and the issues are continually discussed over and over again. How do we get rid of these things? We gotta understand list and project constraints so even if I don't have a goal, if I know what the project constraints are, what the budget is, what the time requirements are, what the benefits are, what the resources I currently have in it, or what the technology are, then 
those constraints are the goal. So I got to work. That answers every question. Hey, I should just buy this software. Well, is it in the budget? No. That software is off the table. Before you code, you should have your test or a bulk of your test. Very easy to pass a test when you know what the test questions are at the beginning. So if you were in school and I gave you all the test questions, there shouldn't be a reason why you don't get 100% on that test. Similarly, in software coding, if you write down all the tests beforehand, my developer can code right to the test. Users should formulate a complex processing test. I don't know, when I come in, I don't know what, how complex uh, and how normal a complex series of events are. You, the user should be calculating those. Test should cover what should happen and what shouldn't. In other words, the administrator should be able to change this value, but a user should not. And you need to be define both of those things. Features need to be ranked and reviewed. New features need to account for existing constraints. And existing constraints often dictate the best solution. Not all features are needed. Let's put them in a back burner in a parking lot. Stakeholders need to agree when a feature is postponed. And the project schedule and clear task responsibilities should be tracked. And finally, expected outcomes. This is all about measurements. You should always, you know you've got problems with measurements um, when there's no sanity check on the outcome. So nobody's saying, hey, is, this, is the outcome realistic? I want to have a process run in three days, but I'm putting in barriers on that process that says uh, this person needs three days to edit, review it and then that person needs three days to review it and the final person needs three days to review it. I can't do it in three days. It's going to be nine days because of the serial nature of that process. Um, I Proposed measurements are not of uh, things are not aligned with project goals. I worked with General Motors. They were measuring the thickness of the paint on a Mercedes Benz and um, for some reason they thought knowing the thickness of the paint on the Mercedes would help them make a better car, well, would make a better paint job on a car, but their real process was, the real problem with cars in this time was that they were always breaking down and they weren't measuring that. So you should, you should measure, measure the things that are important. Inaccurate measurements, things like surveys, they're inaccurate. How many times have you gone into a car dealer and they say, hey, if you tell them it was five-star treatment for me, um, you know, I'll give you this, uh, you know, Cliff, cliff bar, a free oil change. Exactly. That's an inaccurate measurement because you're getting bribed. What's the point of that? New goals after the project is started. That's a problem. Expectations from other industries are applied to our project. Um, those are projects. Uh, those are unrealistic expectations. So you need to create test cases to show example outcomes. You need to you need to do your sanity check of how much content consumption versus production are we going to be doing on here? We need to realign expectations as soon as possible. So when somebody says, we want this to be done in three days, you got to say, hey, it's a serial process and you're giving three days to three different people. You're not going to get it down to nine days. I mean, you're going to get it down to nine days, but you're not going to get it down to three days. So your measurements need to align with expectations. So whatever is expected, you need to make a measurement of that. At the outset, you need to quantify the expectations uh, so that they're testable. This is really difficult um, to be able to test an expectation, but a lot of times uh, you can say, how many new users do I have? How long does it take a new user to get set up? How long does it take to do training or these sorts of things? So, you do have a, you can start with a stake in the ground on all these measurements, but the expectations and goals, you should be able to measure those. Define security roles and role workload as soon as possible. Um, you need to do that up front. It helps clarify that the work effort is going to be worth the return. So people think, hey, I could just put in the system. Now you're adding all these roles and responsibilities. Oh, all it was was you know, a birthday greeting routing system. So it's not worth it because I have a birthday greeting and I have to have a person uh, in charge to say that all the comments that people are making are acceptable and uh, not of a 
of a work nature and not of a um, uh, this is one. <laughs> offensive. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Be upfront what a product can and can't do. So we we do a lot of SharePoint. Um, we do a lot of SharePoint uh, consulting, and so I'm always upfront about that's not out of the box. It's computers. We can get it to do whatever you want it to do, but it's going to add additional support costs to you. It's going to add additional construction costs. So I like to be upfront about what a product can and can't do. So big big takeaways. Keep it simple and plan at the beginning for iterations. Successful systems know that I'm going to change on a monthly basis as things uh, progress. Perform a sanity check. Make sure that what we're doing is, is going to make sense. Take a step back and take a look at that. Play with those people who want to play. Define the test prior to any construction. That way I know I'm going to pass the test. Plan and expect that software is delivered, it's not a car. So a lot of people have this thing um, when they call in a consultant, they say, hey, we want the, it to do X, Y, and Z, and we deliver X, Y, and Z. Um, it's not a car. When I deliver the car, you just have to take it in for oil, che oil checks or whatever. It is an ongoing process. We continue to uh, revamp software, not necessarily we, but software should be continually revamped. Make sure you have clear goals that are measurable and the project should plan to measure those goals as well. Okay, really sped through this, but I hope, uh, hope it gave you some things to think about. Uh, my name again, Andy Coyle. You can get me at Andy Coyle at KeeperConsulting.com. My contact information is there. And when I have time, I blog at coileonsharepoint.wordpress.com. Excellent, and I got one quick question. Um, and this make, this is actually such a good question. I think we almost have to roll it into another topic and do another do a webinar on it. But when it comes to SharePoint, who would you recommend be involved in any like a, a development of SharePoint or deployment of SharePoint? Yeah, from Rocio. And SharePoint's a SharePoint is an underlying framework or tool to manage a bunch of things. It can do a bunch of things. It connects everything. So depending on what the project is. So if it's an intranet, you, you're, if we're constructing an intranet on SharePoint, we should have some stakeholders from each group, IT, HR, accounting, real estate, leases. Um, if it is a singular document library, then it's that particular group. Or I, if it's an application that you want to do, I want to track help desk tickets. I need a user or two involved, people who submit, help desk tickets, and I would need IT involved, how they want to um, work the help desk tickets. So the, when I say consumer and producer, I would like a couple of consumers of whatever that feature is and a bunch of producers as the stakeholders. So whoever needs to produce into the system, I want them to be uh, attending design, development, testing, and some of the consumers so that I get the consumer point of view. Awesome. Well, I think we got a December topic now, so this is good. Ah. All right. Well, um, thank you guys for, for joining us today. And uh, I did get somebody asking if we could get a copy of this presentation and we can share some of this information with uh, the group. So uh, do look for an email from me. And um, thanks, you guys. And if you do have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us at Kiefer. Um, and again, thank you for your time today. Hopefully this information was good um, and you were uh, you got a lot out of it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.